like when Valorant came out, I really thought like maybe I should go pro in this. There's probably a lot more money there. It's probably a lot more competitive. There's just a million things you have to be mentally prepared for. I actually don't think that any other game could tilt me anymore. I think I'm tilt proof. So I sit there and then some fan took a photo of us through a bush sitting together. Jesus what Christ. The and they got fuck? posted on uh, Weibo, which is like yeah. Chinese Twitter. Yeah. And they were saying like all this like sexual stuff towards her like Alrighty, hello everybody and welcome to episode 2 of the Jake and Guz show and for the first time in the history of the channel we will be venturing outside the world of Rainbow Six Jake and entering yeah. a world that I am not particularly familiar with but this is uh, pretty much your bread and butter or was, was. your bread and butter <laughs> fuck was wasn't it yeah Sorry. good old uh, PUBG so we've got special guest a uh, good friend of mine Tiggleton James uh, welcome on to the Jake and Gus show it's great to obviously have you on here Thanks obviously our channel is a little bit uh, more siege related typically but give maybe those unaware of who you are a short little introduction yeah uh, I'm James Tiggleton I uh, play a lot of PUBG been playing since 2018 and I moved to America to compete for Sonics, the org. Um, we won Worlds in 2021, and we recently won an international event this year. So doing pretty well, and uh, just here to talk some smack, to be honest. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> you just come back from overseas. You come home, visit home, usually at the end of every year. So um, good to have you back home, obviously. And um, first time for us not talking about Siege, which is refreshing refreshing um obviously for you it's been a, a long journey you've been doing this now for quite a while when you started you were underage you were <laughs> you're a sub underage you were yep. scrimming um i think you were maybe sub for certain teams chiefs maybe at one point um sub for every team it's been a it's been a long time reflecting back has it been everything that you you thought it would be uh well i mean i didn't really have any expectations like so the start of my career i was substituting for chiefs atletico and event um i was just bouncing around i was known as the the sub slot so, <laughs> <laughs> um so i got into my course at monash uni i missed out on like the ideal course i wanted by like one or two atar points because i was just playing PUBG my whole year 12. <laughs> um so i got into like some other degree that was pretty good and i went for two weeks and then i got this offer to move to america to join a tier two team at the time but they said they'd get me a visa and i was like didn't take a gap year might as well send it see where it goes and that was for like fifteen hundred dollars a month at the time so it wasn't like a extravagant offer straight off the bat uh i was just doing it for fun really yeah you were playing npl weren't you mm -hmm. yeah yeah so when i first moved i was playing contenders which is like the tier two league that was all online and then the npl the pro league was uh in person at the ogn studio in california been there good studio oh you have been I've there, been there. Have you? okay yeah. it, was, it was honestly honestly one of the better events it was pgc 2019 when they were doing the group stage stuff um which was a lot of fun to be able to cast out of there and um then we eventually went to the arena which is <laughs> hey, is that when the famous moment happened yeah what was it um forever forever on one, one hp, HP. <laughs> the two times at a prayer no it was good fun <laughs> um obviously james you weren't uh particularly participating at the time at pgc level no. so um what was that kind of like i guess because that's a very intriguing moment in your career i think it was the last time where you were really a spectator at a really big PUBG event, PGC 2019. From that point onwards, you were basically a player at all of those big events. I mean, yeah, watching an esport event in the crowd, uh, I don't think there's anything that could be more motivating to a player. Like, um, I flew the whole way across America, so it was like a six hour flight to go there. And obviously I streamed a lot of PUBG at the time, so I had a couple of friends, a lot of people knew me. Um, so it, it was pretty enjoyable, but it, it kind of sucked in the other hand because for example, Luke 12, he was always like my, my rival in Australia, my competitor, and he qualified for this event. Um, he kind of like fast tracked the whole like mm. MPLC, NPL process by joining a top tier team off the rip and like getting to play. So I was really, uh, I was really jealous at the time, but it worked out. <laughs> to be to be fair for Luke, he just actually played GLL Grand Slam with Atletico and they finished second. Right. And ah, got yeah. got picked up. I think it was Lazarus, mm -hmm. Shoot to Kill, whatever they were at the time. They've had like 10 different names, TSM. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, so, and he actually did well. He made it all the way to the, to the finals at mm -hmm. the time. They actually finished first in their winner's bracket. Yeah, that's right. And then they kind of shit the bed, come, come, <laughs> come finals in the, uh, in the arena. Um, so we'll actually maybe now transition it from PGC 19 to 23, because it's so recent, so fresh, so new. Thailand uh, return for you, because obviously we had PUBG Nations Cup in Thailand last year. So back to Thailand you went. What was, what was the experience like for you 
um, for this PGC? I guess expectations, as always, for you and your team. Um, do you feel like you met expectations? Do you feel, feel like maybe you, you didn't? Uh, we definitely fell short of expectations. Um, although I would like to give us a little bit of leadway because we did make a roster change before PGC. And also, I was extremely sick during the finals. I got like the worst flu ever and I was just sweating bullets. I went back and I watched the replays and I was like missing so much obvious information on my screen because I was just like dehydrated. Um, so like it makes sense that we placed, uh, we placed 11th out of 32. So he did make it to like the grand finals lobby. It's not the worst performance ever, but coming off of our win at the international earlier this year, it wasn't exactly what we were hoping for. I think always when it comes to, to you guys, it's like, the expectation is on either win or bust, right? Like, is, is that yeah. what you feel like is the external pressure? Um, I, that's just, I don't think that's like the pressure. I just think that that's how our team is. Like, sometimes we're just like, all right, we're going to win this thing. And then we go ahead and win it. And other times yeah. the vibe just isn't there. It's weird. It's like, it's like it's either manifested or it's not. <laughs> you mentioned the roster change. So, I mean, if you're comfortable talking about sort of Mime and his departure, what was the, the cause of that? What, what kind of led to that decision? I don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I literally said to this guy before we went live, I'm like, if you don't want to talk about something, just say you don't want to talk about it. No, fair enough. It's, it's it, honestly credit, James, for, for saying you don't want to talk about it. Um, I think obviously it's a fair question though. We won't actually talk about it, but um, there's always going to be that debate when changes are made and then everyone looks at it in hindsight and the reflection of mm -hmm. it. I was looking at a lot of comments after the event and everyone's like, oh, mine wasn't the problem, things like that. But yeah. Do you kind of look at that and think like, people just don't really know kind of what's actually happening internally? Yeah, of course. I think that like the 99% of the fan base doesn't really understand what happens internally on an esports team. And it's really easy to draw conclusions from the outside based on like, you know specific moments that they might see but like it's like imagine tuning into my stream for 10 minutes seeing me tilted and then making a judgment on my personality based on that 10 minutes you know yeah. it's easy to like take snippets or like have a reference frame that isn't like really true does that make sense yeah yeah so so obviously you end up uh making the change play the tournament I mean, I guess, was there anything that surprised you about this tournament, maybe in terms of the actual play, the actual competition itself from the teams, um, the meta? Um, was there anything that kind of caught you guys by surprise a little bit? Or do you feel like everything you planned for came to fruition? Um, PUBG is not really that RNG. I mean, it, it always surprises me how good the players are. The players are just insane these days. But I mean, it's like before this tournament, I could have told you who the top three teams were going to be. Mm. And I think that that's kind of a stigma around PUBG esports recently that's kind of it gets on my nerves a little bit like for example i watched summit 1g the other day just go on this huge rant for like 15 minutes after playing some PUBG, and he's like i've seen more competitive circles in connect four <laughs> and i was like yeah but it's like a poker tournament you know you yeah it's odds but it's a lot of odds and you get to play it correctly a lot and then eventually you'll win you know it's not the same as like mm. the lottery or something i guess I'm, I'm probably somebody that has that more sort of casual ranked whatever perspective and probably listen to some at 1G on that sort of opinion. <laughs> what do you think differentiates a more casual player or, or mindset like his to, you know, a pro professional player that actually understands a game on the deeper level like that? Well, because I think that it's really easy to look at the map 2D and just be like, the middle of the circle is good. Like the middle of the circle is the best part. But like, as the circle closes, like the new edge now becomes playable because there's no flank, there's no angles like behind it. So I think that people don't really like grasp how fair the positioning actually is on the map. Um, to the point where like if a team is really consistently good at team fighting and stuff they'll win the tournament mm. oh, I want to ask you a question it's less about PGC probably more so just about the way teams approach the game I always see this conversation about like edge teams and like center teams mm. and I've always been of the belief that's almost a total crock of shit that's my own personal belief because I think the, the best teams will be able to play both styles and should be able to play both styles. But from your own perspective, do you think that is actually the truth that there are teams that are like, no, we only want the edge. We're an edge team, like fuck the center. Like, <laughs> like what's, your, yeah. what's your thoughts on that conversation? I mean, there's definitely some teams like, uh, if I reflect on the, the history of PUBG, like DA, the old Turkish team, digital athletics, yeah. they used to just completely crash the middle of the circle and prone in a dip every single time. And like, I mean, I don't think they won any events, but I don't think they... Oh, they did come 16th actually a couple of times. But like, I don't think outside of them, there's like no other team that comes to mind in terms of having such a strong preference. Like, 
everyone tries to play for the middle. That's the name of the game. Mm. But like, well, not necessarily the middle, right? More so, it's, it's the not best playing position for the middle. The best position, the yeah. I mean, we call it prior. So yeah. like, there's there's the best spot that our team can get before we have to fight someone. Yeah, that is like what everyone plays for, and then they make plays based out of that. I feel like also best position to how you can capitalize the most on a circle. Sometimes you might look at a position and think. At first glance, it's not that great, but it's like, what can we do with that? Can we spread out? Can we take yeah, exactly. good map control, things like that? So well, I'm, you're not probably in agreement fully, but I think, yeah, the stigma of like, oh, they're an edge team. They only want the edge. I think is, <laughs> is bullshit. Would you agree? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's some teams that definitely like tend to just lag a little, but I don't think that that's like by choice. I think that's just like indecision. Yeah. It, maybe poor rotations as yeah, well. Yeah. So they'll end up on the edge a lot, but it's not like, oh, we want to be here. It's yeah. like, oh, I don't know where to go. <laughs> in, in saying that, playing devil's advocate to myself, I guess there's probably some teams that might play better on edge and taking fights and being able to sweep and rotate, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Like there's teams where if you put their backs against the wall, they'll just drop everyone around them and you're like, hell, did they just make that work? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess wrapping up PGC, we probably don't need to talk about PGC 23 too much like I mean 11th not bad obviously I think you guys would have at least been aiming top 10 minimum from finals right like that yeah. would have probably been like so in some ways you probably don't hit the expectations you would have had you would have liked to finish a little higher up but from a personal perspective for yourself obviously you mentioned you were sick you weren't feeling the best but when you were feeling fine and that wasn't there do you feel like you played to the level you know you can play at no but I always struggle to play to that level in group stage like before I got sick in the tournament, so like the there's like multiple stages to the tournament. Uh, in group stage, we played pretty well. We were fragging out, and then in winners bracket, we like destroyed the first day, and then the second day we just like bombed out. But I think it's because we showed up with the idea that like we didn't really have to play that day because mm. we only needed like twenty points or something to qualify. Yeah. Um, somewhat going back to last year's PGC, if you want to maybe cast your mind back to Dubai, there was the um, hot dropping in Pachinki. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually watching that. I, I distinctively remember watching that, yeah. Talk us through the um, decision process for that at the time, as a team maybe, or even individually, because obviously there's a lot of commentary in and around it. Should they, should they give it up? Should they not? Should you keep fighting for it? What are the ramifications for, for giving it up? Um, I mean, maybe just talk us through sort of what happened last year with the... Uh, basically self-destructing <laughs> in Pachinki. Yeah, I mean, I was of the opinion that if we had any intention of leaving Pachinki, there was like, there was like a little bit of internal conflict on the team at this point in time. Uh, because leading into the event, I was like, I remember explicitly stating in scripts, I was like, if we're going to leave Pachinki after like a day or two of hard dropping, we should never go in the first place. We should practice out of a different spot. And then the whole team was like, we're going to fight for it. I'm willing to die there, like mm. no matter what. I was like, all right, that works for me. Like, let's go. <laughs> and then we got there and we got clapped on the first day because yeah. that 17, the Chinese team, is just like unbelievably talented at hard dropping. Like, yeah. they know Pachinki, like, it's a Counter Strike map. They have like nade yeah. lineups and stuff. Like, you just get. It's, a, it, it's almost a game within the game when you're playing Absolutely. Like, close quarter Pachinki. Yeah. I remember watching it and I think it was, sorry to say, eight, 10 seconds in, you were first death of the entire game. Yeah, quarter. exactly. <laughs> the most picked fantasy player. I remember this tweet PUBG made. They were like, the most picked fantasy player dead in 15 seconds. I was like, <laughs> yeah, sure I, had, I, I had you on my team as well so i was a little bit disappointed and i think when that happened and in, in that first game i think it ended up being not a total whitewash that very first game might have got to like 2-2 two, two. Like that it was, was 50, a, 50 but that um, time was against the malaysian team uh they were taiwanese malaysian yeah mix but the expectation was you should have been able to push them out yeah yeah we thought that they would leave that was a really weird situation and was it 17 though. gaming the other one yeah so 17's yeah. like the real team to like yeah. beat but the SGD was the Taiwanese Malaysian yeah. team and they were strange because they were like yeah we'll hot drop the Sonics but we won't hot drop 17 yeah so I was I like what that. yeah what's up with what? that like what does this even and make they, sense they, they, had, they had some good frag as Shen um, obviously has gone yeah. on and done some really good things so they were and I actually had been casting them prior to PGC for I don't even know if it was PCS I think it would have been PCS at the time and they obviously did really well mm -hmm. they were really a solid close quarter team yep. but when it came to the macro play outside of that they were pretty dog shit and i think they actually in the end got you guys at their best like that was their best way of playing the game was those close quarter fights yeah. fighting for the city had it been out in the fields or whatever or fighting for position you would have probably smoked them um but anyway that ends up happening you guys end up kind of getting shit on and that from there probably snowballed into a pretty poor tournament you'd say yeah absolutely and korea before that it was just complete shambles what were the, what were the lessons from it the lessons um 
to have better preparation really because like if we're coming into it with the mindset that like we're gonna we're not gonna leave then to show up and then change the plan never a good idea because you know i remember a quote from our igl he was like i can call out of any position like we're okay to leave mm. and then we left to a spot and like he's a smart guy he's really good at calling i mean we've won a million events under him but like i i think that that was like kind of us having a big ego and that thinking that we could go into a new loop location unrehearsed in the best lobby in the world and then still like play well so yeah we just got clapped when yep. we started learning different spots <laughs> so we'll pivot away from esports at least for a little bit for the moment um obviously outside of competing you have a very successful uh content career on youtube streaming as well um how are you enjoying that grind and how would you maybe compare that lifestyle with competing and you know trying to do both at the same time yeah i mean i don't even really know why i started streaming i was like 16 and i just started i just bought a webcam and i just started streaming on like 1100 bit rate <laughs> some terrible stream quality i just did it for fun Aussie internet yeah because i was i was like rank one in solo queue at the time so i was like ah, oh, whatever maybe people want to watch me and then um i just ended up doing it for fun because i was on the team with critical motion who was like a at the time he was like a, one of the biggest PUBG oce streamers a couple of viewers and i was always like looking up to him and aspiring to be like him so uh yeah i just started streaming for fun and then it kind of blew up and i think that that's like half the reason that i went pro and do what i do now is because i really enjoy streaming and it's like it's the nicest way for me to practice because i can sit there i can make money i can enjoy myself have a nice meaningful community and practice all at the same time they're the benefits what are maybe some of the challenges of doing both being a streamer and still a pro player what probably hinders you a little bit maybe even in, in both categories like by being a pro player does it hinder streaming streaming hinder being a pro i think for many games it probably there is like a hindrance like if i was playing counter-strike professionally i'd probably have to dedicate more time to scrims than stream etc but i think PUBG, just like the niche game it is it's way more conducive to me getting more hours in the game playing more being more practiced mm. uh live streaming at the same time the only real hindrance for me is there's like the extra pressure you know because i get a lot of dms i get a lot of nosy people a lot of people <laughs> just like you know making posts stalkers just weird stuff that like influences me when i'm at these tournaments these people try to like throw me off or you know you've had um very rich people show up with some very nice cars as well i think at oh, one yeah. Tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah obviously there's there's some advantages like that i think uh at, in saudi arabia yeah. in pgs2 earlier this year we had a, a traditional saudi feast prepared for us it was like a whole lamb on a bed of rice just like jeez for our team i guess there are some perks after that was pretty all. dope yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh, do you find i guess both to be equally enjoyable like you look at streaming and playing pro i guess separately right so do you look at them being both equally enjoyable or do you maybe favor one slightly more than the other i kind of look at them as a like they, they kind of complement each other in that i'm an extremely competitive person like i don't think i could go work a nine to five and not be competing against someone else so i'm like i need to measure myself and like be better than other people to have satisfaction and want to continue to do stuff so i really like playing pro for that it satisfies yeah. like that whole itch of just like wanting to be the best and all that yeah. but uh streaming is like it's just a way more like relaxed enjoyable time where i can be myself and have personality mm. and it's not just about like the grind and you know how good's my aim <laughs> well it seems like you're enjoying both but i guess metrics money aside if you had to pick one to dedicate your focus to you could only choose one streaming or competing do you know which one you would go for that's really difficult see i would want to say streaming because i think that money wise it's like a more uh, sustainable future but uh, if i sat there playing games live on stream eight hours a day i think i'd end up losing hair because i'd just be like <laughs> i'd just be raging all day like that all these casual players were like killing me or i'm playing as them because there's no ranked in pubg you know it's like mm. I'd have to branch off and like find something else to do for sure. Well, that's an interesting question though, because I've seen a lot of streamers who they obviously go big in one title, one game, and that's where their following is. And then they like try to switch it up and you almost see like in some cases, 80 to 90% reduction in views. Is that something that you 
almost fear that like if you want to branch into something else that you almost have to restart a little bit yeah that's a huge fear like when valorant came out i really thought like maybe i should go pro in this there's probably a lot more money there it's probably a lot more competitive um so i get that some serious thought and i kind of realized that like i didn't want to because i was i'm in a good spot with PUBG. i didn't want to like throw that away just mm. for like a chance so there, there definitely is a fear factor but i'm also of the opinion that if i put my mind to something uh i can do it yeah. so like if i do switch then i'm gonna go off a leather on that and try and make it work i think that um for me like obviously i don't stream doing casting though is not similar but there are some similar tendencies like you kind of do a lot of the same stuff like you're obviously casting the same game unless you're doing multiple titles um not every talent gets to do that what's it like i guess when you're just playing the same game over and over again like i've always looked at it as like i feel fortunate as a game I, i'm not hard stuck to just one title i feel like i'd just get bored like as much as i love a certain game after a while i'd be like i really don't feel like playing this today but when it's your job I, like you've just got to play PUBG, right mm -hmm. well that's the beauty of PUBG, though is it's like so creative i've never played the same game twice it's like in counter-strike there's only so many executes you can do only so many like times you can one tap a whole five-man roster it feels like a lot more repetitive <laughs> like i would say that PUBG is fun in that it's probably the most creative fps mm. in the way i see it where like you can do whatever you want you know you could put 10 gas cans under a car launch it into space and then parachute down and win the game like there's just unlimited possibilities yeah might have to get him in the siege stack if you like so Ooh. creative fps yeah probably not quite as creative as PUBG, but it gets close um in talking about different games, I saw your your clip on Twitter a few months back unboxing the uh, the Karambit in, in CS2, <laughs> and I know you've mentioned Counter Strike a couple of times now. Yeah. So, when you're not competing, when you're not streaming PUBG, what are you doing with yourself, and maybe what other games are you participating in? Uh, well, I had to play Counter Strike 2 when it came out because I grew up playing Counter Strike only. Like I've, when I was like 12 years old, I think I had 2,000 hours in Counter Strike Source. Jeez, I used to play the Warcraft 3 mods all day. Yeah. Like, I loved it so much. So yeah i just had to play cs2 and then obviously for the stream content i was like maybe i'll do a little unboxing and uh Cozzy, who's like my ex-teammate from australia he comes in the chat he says beginner's luck's real like you always get a knife <laughs> in your first 10 crates and then they don't give you anything after that i was like yeah 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 karambit doppler in like the seventh crate i was like oh all right <laughs> do, you, do you still have the knife uh, i do still have it but i probably should have sold it because the market's plummeting at the moment <laughs> i think it's recovering a little bit so you'll be fine yeah, in the long yeah. run nice. well, what else do you kind of do with yourself outside of gaming outside of streaming outside of mm -hmm. comp like in your off time are you still just at the computer playing other games or are you just out like doing other things do you play sport what, what, what does james do in his off time uh it's a funny question but the answer is a little bit sad like uh i feel like my whole life at the moment is grind mode like i don't really have like that outlet yeah so like i literally wake up i go to the gym well i eat breakfast go to the gym stream and then have like a 30 minute break scrim and then sleep i i don't really like make a lot of time for hobbies outside of that because i just figured like this is a i don't have a lot of time to be an <laughs> esports pro and a streamer living in america so i figured i should yeah. like make the most of it if that makes sense is so. that something you've thought about maybe finding time for something else for a way to maybe de-stress a little bit from the grind or you're just so committed to it and you're, you're fine with the, the grind at the level that it's at at the moment i mean yeah i just downloaded hinge <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah that's one way to, to probably segue all right well, we'll well actually I, I did want to touch on just briefly okay. i had it listed there um other battle royales are there any others that pique your interest i mean apex is one that came to mind for me and that has you know quite a strong competitive scene were you ever compelled to maybe compete in that like you were with with valorant for instance yeah actually i thought about it a lot and uh i met a lot of apex streamers recently in austin because that's like the hub for them um the reason i love PUBG is because it's kind of balanced for a battle royale if that makes sense like apex i think i would just pull my hair out playing against like aim assist controller players mm. or like eh, the match point system i think is like extremely difficult to be a consistent winner because people just target in you so like i don't really see like a world where i would enjoy that more than PUBG, just based on the fact that i see it as like less competitive i think you're at a detriment nowadays in apex legends if you're mouse and keyboard as well like 90 percent yeah. of the players are like on control yeah i mean like even some of the most talented 
keyboard players <laughs> went over to controller yeah. and the one thing in apex that always shits me compared to PUBG, i think it's a far more viewable and probably playable experience is like the rotations mid-game actually are meaningful whereas in apex it's just everyone stacks the edge of the circle and it's just this big final fight yeah, like, all, you know, it's completely yeah. different no, <laughs> it's just circle. dog shit yeah i mean so uh, i guess well talking about maybe PUBG now the way it is it's actually got some of those things you know you've got like the mm -hmm. parachute um um the pickup system you've got many different ways to rotate compared to back in the day w which version of PUBG do you prefer like if you could go back and be like 2018 PUBG Erin Girl maybe Miramar that's it or do you kind of enjoy the changes that have come through I love all the changes that have come through actually in PUBG I think that everything has made it more competitive the only thing I dislike is the weapon balancing at the moment okay. I think that the guns are like just absurdly hard to use because since 2018 they've just kept on increasing the recoil because players get so good at controlling it mm. and then they're always like well the good players are using this gun and killing everyone so let's nerf it so like the guns these days are like you have to use your whole mouse pattern to be like sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you maybe from your own perspective change about it to maybe have a little bit more balance to the amount of guns because there's a lot more guns now as well that are actually mm. in the game compared to like 2018 well when you like nerf a gun and you increase the recoil on it for example that doesn't mean that the good players are going to stop using it all that does is increase the skill gap between the bad players and the good players because the good players will adjust to the change and the bad players will not be able to so i think everything needs to be like easier if that makes sense like 2018 pubg so it's easier for the casual player to log on and not mm. whiff their entire magazine every spray yeah what about from a comp perspective uh now versus 2018 2019 if you think back obviously you weren't playing those really big tournaments like the original pgis and the mm. first pgc and even the first pnc for example but like uh, you obviously still played the game professionally you were scrimming you were playing comp PUBG. did you prefer i guess the more simplicity nature of it back then and maybe more of the unknown now things have obviously been quite figured out by a lot of the top teams top players which kind of do you prefer i mean obviously it was a lot more fun back then but that's just because it was a lot more random people were just doing weird stuff all the time a lot more laughable moments like shenanigans these days everything's a little bit more ironed out mm. and uh mm, i don't know which one i'd prefer uh, it's actually it's a hard question i think i prefer these days just because it's more competitive and there's more like competitive integrity it's less random yep well, I, guess. I guess then for you um there's that enjoyment factor you probably enjoy it now more there's more to the game as well there's a little bit more yeah. substance to it so I, I, I kind of fuck with that what about the maps though obviously maps in PUBG <laughs> have always Wait. been like <laughs> the biggest debate when it comes to maps if we go back firstly when Miramar first came in and then you had Sandhawk which was a, a massive debate in itself the fact that it was even at PGC 2019 and it was just a shambles of a map like 20 minute games really small it was shit um, now you've got Vikendi which I still don't like even with the changes Tago's been good um a lot of people are liking rondo but like having to play so many different maps now versus back in the day when it was just aaron gull and a little bit of miramar or whatever like what's your thoughts on the map rotation in, in comp pubg uh this is actually an interesting question um but there's actually 10 maps now in pubg in total isn't that insane i feel like people don't realize that it's fucked yeah but I, not, I had no not, idea they're, they're not all equal though well, like, you've got, different like, sizes little ones, like yeah. carrigan and whatnot there's, right? there's four eight by eight maps yeah which is absolutely insane the amount of terrain i kind of don't like it as much because you can't learn four eight by eight maps in a year to perfection mm -hmm. like it's so difficult so there's like we're playing vikendi at pgc it's the first tournament that we're playing vikendi at it's a new eight by eight map um there's snowstorms on it oh, don't get me started so on like that. randomly a snowstorm will just spawn and blind like half the players inside it and there's polar bears too there was yeah, this i saw that that, yeah. that clip on twitter i was like what the fuck could you imagine that happening in any other esport title just some random bear coming up and just fucking sniping someone it like it knocked dude. out a team yeah, yeah i, I yeah. saw the clip i was like Purple what the fuck move. is that they, they had like a chance of qualifying it was a solo guy live they needed like three more points so if he clutched up like a little bit there was like a chance that they could have qualified a little rank tank yeah and he's just running running this bear just comes out of nowhere, sideswipes and boom, he's gone instantly. Oh, and the whole home crowd is just like, oh, like, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I don't know. I think the uh, PUBG needs to like reflect on what's competitive and what's not maybe a little bit. You but, know what I re it reminds me of is when red zones were a thing in the OG, oh, OG pump, uh, oh PUBG God. comp scene and they yep. were in and then everyone's like, no, fuck, get this shit out. And they took it out. So like, why are you now putting in dust storms 
Why are you putting in snowstorms? Why are you putting in polar bears? I don't like that <laughs> shit. I'm fine with all the other changes. You've got your flare guns and you've got extra rotate options and vehicles, whatever. Like, that's all fine. Hell, even the ballistic shield is shit as it is. Um, but having, uh, like, RNG factors like polar bears and the snowstorms, I'm not a fan of that. I don't think you should have that in. Is that something players have, like, given feedback to of course yeah that's like the first thing all the players said it's like what is this what is the snowstorm get the bears out but i don't know i'm convinced that PUBG understands that their whole viewer base is like is the word masochists like people that enjoy pain <laughs> <laughs> so like the snowstorm spawns on their favorite team and they're all like oh like it's an entertaining thing yeah like it's, it's frustrating and then i don't know i guess i guess we're just supposed to like it <laughs> i feel like sometimes when you watch PUBG, it's it's a bit like the hunger game series right like you're sending in 64 players and they're about to just get fucked some way one way or another and that's part of the entertainment i guess of PUBG. and i guess as a pro player do you kind of just have to accept that in some ways like in your game that you're professional at and it's all about minimizing rng that there's going to be extra rng elements that you kind of have to watch out for but that's part of the, the entertainment i mean absolutely like uh, uh, entertainment aside when you have 64 computers running on a stage and there's a chance your game crashes like oh there's just a million things that you have to be mentally prepared for i actually don't think that any other game could tilt me anymore i think i'm tilt proof has uh, we've been through conditioning has that segued us to qm <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't talk about qm <laughs> we don't talk about that we, yeah the, our team we brought that up uh, internally in a meeting and then like that's that we're just leaving that yeah was it shrimacy that led the front on that um i think it was pretty much every player right okay yeah, I mean, obviously, um, it's not like it affected you, but it it galvanized the community a little bit from a lot of the outcry that I saw. Like, everyone was kind of, like, all in agreement that, like, something went wrong. Obviously, it's a touchy subject, and I'm sure had I been at the event, I would have been told, don't speak about it. I wasn't at the event, so I'll speak about it. <laughs> I know that you can only probably say so much on it, but I think without diving too much into it, I mean, you're aware as to what happened? I have no idea what you're talking about, so please enlighten. So I think it was the was it the last game? Um, of winners? No, so it was the third to last third match to last. of the uh, last losers. chance qualifier. Yeah, the losers. So there's whatever. like a, it's like there's four teams who are in contention to qualify for the grand finals. One is Petrical Road, who's like the one of the biggest Chinese teams. They have like a guy on it who's like the same size as Shroud in China. Genji, QM, and then some other team. I can't remember who else. QM is like a unsigned wrestling team. It was an impact team at the bottom. Yeah. yeah and um in like one of the final matches for some reason because thailand just has like really dodgy power uh all four of qm's pcs just shut down they just like lost power to like their booth specifically in the middle of the match so they just got like eradicated how from far the game. from i didn't actually see it live but how far into it did it actually happen so it was like circle three and like they could have played into a spot they would have had like a good game like i'm almost certain that had their stuff not crashed they would have qualified like yeah I'd, I'd give them like a 99% chance of qualifying. Yeah. So does PUBG have any like anti-crash mechanic? Because I know Apex Legends added one, for instance, right? Where they can like pause, pause the lobby and yeah. then resume it. Is that still not a thing in PUBG? No. And that's where the gray area was. So the rules has like a bunch of like, there's like a bunch of different uh, points in it to say like, if a player crashes while the plane is still in the air, restart the game. If a player crashes like this, like that, like this, like that, whatever. But like generally if a player just crashes in the middle of a match there's just like no compensation it's like unlucky yeah. um they did not have a rule in this instance that said that this team should be compensated anything or the match should be restarted so that's kind of why everyone was like well what so like it wasn't in the rule book that they should have received any compensation or the match should be restarted which is kind of uh, I think that's a bit unfair to be yeah. honest but yeah it, it, it probably speaks volumes more to what the fact that there wasn't actually anything in place for an event such as this for a situation such as this and that's probably where the conversation is obviously it's no one's fault that their power shut off no one's blaming PUBG and like oh you know it's their fault that that happened absolutely not but it's sort of like well maybe for future tournaments let's have something in place for when things like this happen and it can cost these teams lots of lots of money um lots of an opportunity obviously to make the finals itself it's a bit disappointing and you think obviously then as a player what if that happened to us you know what if yeah. you guys are like just a couple of points away from qualifying last game and you're in a really good position and you know you're probably going to go and get the points needed and then bam you, you know pc shut off and it's like it's happened to a lot of players individually the amount of times i've seen a player just running off into the field yeah, because right. the dc um has been a thing for a long time so and there's always been things in place where 
you know, if it happens like if a crash during the, the plane path, we'll reset the lobby, etc. So there are things in place for certain situations, but it's like, where do you draw the line? Like, is it like after phase two circle, there's just nothing we can do if shit happens, shit happens? That's kind of the feedback we gave them was like, if there's, they need to get like very specific. So like if a whole team crashes before phase three, they need to instantly reset it. We said like phase three was like, that's kind of the cutoff where like, yeah. beyond that, it's like, oh, I always feel like, what's phase three, like 12 minutes? Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. I always feel like not much happens first 10 minutes. Yeah. So I feel like anything inside the first 10 minutes, 100% should be restart. Even if a team had a lucky, you know, hot drop. Unless you're hot on. dropping Pachinki. Uh, yeah, that, that's, but that's, where, that's where the issues are. What happens if you're like hot dropping Pachinki, you win the battle and yeah. another team on the other side of the fucking map DCs and they're like restart. Exactly. So that's, that's where the whole like competitive integrity issue comes in. And then like, if, if it wasn't written in the rule book prior and then they made this Russian team qualify by compensating them points over China's favorite shroud size <laughs> streamer, like then there's backlash on the other end that's like well what if they didn't qualify yeah. like it's so like it's just ambiguous so it's a really difficult situation to be honest yeah i just think events in thailand are kind of scuffed because this is the second time this has actually happened the met asia series in 2019 also had power issues in a very that was similar a whole building. way yeah yeah it was like a whole building yeah, yeah. and uh yeah, the, the land client there was like pretty laggy as well. Like we had like 15 ping instead of like in Saudi, we had one. So I was, I was a bit confused. They canceled that event, the MET Asia series, like halfway through. No, Gen Z won it. No? I swear they, like something happened to that event where Gen they- Gen Z got a, a pan in game. They got a pan skin for winning it. Something happened there that tournament. <laughs> we'll get to the bottom of it. Later, yeah, we got to read up on that yeah, after. Something happened. I remember because it was a very controversial tournament. Uh -huh, I exactly. think it was like, maybe they- restarted it or something or yeah like they had big power issues but yeah we'll move on i guess um now one of the tournaments that i've really enjoyed watching especially with you casting it i think you casted it in 20 i've done all of them except for this year's one the pubg nations cup yeah nations cup which um, no one apparently did fucking this year's one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently um i'm interested to hear your thoughts on this event because for instance in rainbow six we were meant to have a world cup um you know a lot of the orgs i'm led to believe were, were kind of against it thinking that it would uh, interrupt players and their ability to practice how do you view that event do you get excited for it is it disruptive to you know your other plans um what, what's the vibe so historically it would be such a big tournament that we would have like a month's preparation to scrim and stuff as our team and i guess there is some sort of dis disruption there but when you take like the best players out of every team regionally and then you leave all the other players it's not like it's just a disruption to the players that are playing the tournament it's a disruption to everybody so it's kind of fair and balanced in my opinion um this year's nations cup though was like one event ended and then within the next month we had already traveled to the other country and played the whole nations cup and left so it was like really just like they kind of banged it out mm. it's quite fast and uh i thought that was a lot more enjoyable it's more of like a show match type thing it's not like it's a full-blown pumped up tournament. yeah because it, it never will be the most competitive tournament ever if it's nations you know and uh it's actually the PUBG event that gets the most viewership like more than pgc more than anything else it gets like not this year not this year no. yeah well typically yeah well i think that's because the, the... you won't cast again <laughs> no one fucking casted besides paper thin um <laughs> i think yeah this year's one looked rushed to me it didn't look like it had that same level of um care for it um I mean, I could be wrong but like i think last year's uh the, the thailand one last year um was obviously a lot of fun the original one in korea i know you weren't at that one but that was at the time like the biggest tournament and yeah. i think for a long time actually pubg nations cup 2019 was one of the biggest ones but like it, it's such a strange one because you're right like it the amount of times i've seen like you know you see um scrim results of like team denmark is like in a lobby with like team great britain or whatever or like it, it kind of fucks everything up mm. in terms of the ecosystem right so is it worth it the players want it but then the players that do get to do it such as yourself like it is an enjoyable experience you get a chance to make more money like it's, yeah. it's still a big fun tournament like where, where do you kind of sit with its place in the calendar I mean, I absolutely love it. Uh, the biggest issue for me is just like, from an org standpoint, none of the players that are going to this tournament are representing their organizations. Mm. And thus the org is not entitled to any prize pool or like sponsorship advertisement. You know what I mean? There's no like jerseys. So I think that that's kind of like the most damaging part of it to the ecosystem. 
because as much as so many people watch it and it's great for the players they get to go it's kind of like it's just great for them it's not great for everyone else that's like in the scene if that makes sense i remember um thailand we had team bliss actually came over because i think they had a player one yeah, of their players did. was in the, the team and it was just sort of like but you're not getting any recognition yeah. despite the fact that you're here you're helping you know you got a player there and i think that's a big part of probably like what you said with siege a lot of the orgs are sort of like well we get nothing out of this like we get no involvement we get no money there's no screen time for us um but it's also such a tournament loved by the fans that you almost can't just can it like for the logistics of it the exactly. fans are just like this is one of our favorite tournaments this is part of the the calendar um it's also a lot of fun when team uh, players and as fans speculate who's going to be on the team f from the players themselves so mm -hmm. uh it's a it's a tricky one i i think from a caster's perspective having done a lot of them um they're some of my favorite ones to do because you've kind of got this like all-star lineup across the board on every single team for the most part like 90 percent of the team's like stacked so it's like a really stacked lobby it's like a pgc because of the level of competition so playing it for you do you feel that when you play like a PUBG nations cup <laughs> and every single player is just like the best really that you've got to offer no 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 there's no there's no team chemistry at all it feels like a ranked like random pubs lobby like i remember like <laughs> we're playing and we're looking at these teams rotating there's people everywhere guys in smokes and then we go to peak this ridge and this guy on team india was prone in a like okay, a team grass next a to different. us <laughs> middle of nowhere just drops my teammate insta flushes him i'm like what is going on like i was it's such a confusing event every single time because no one has any practice against each other because yeah. everyone flies it there's no scrims or yeah. there's like one or two practice matches and everyone just hot drops pachinki so <laughs> you just have this like unrehearsed lobby like PUBG is usually like a big play because the teams know exactly what the other teams do so you can kind of like yeah have a reference in these ones it's just like so whatever. thailand last year and this year um in korea was it yeah yeah you had pretty much the same roster three out of the four were the same between last year's nation sky so you flood yeah. luke and then in thailand was monty this year you had cow yeah yeah um i guess what was the differences for you guys as a team going into it thailand versus korea this year uh we had way less time to prepare so we did scrim a bunch against these chinese lobbies i got us into like the china scrims which was really good because we were scrimming against like 17 like some of the best teams in the world and uh, we did pretty well in scrims to be honest but i think that doing good in scrims sometimes is like a, a debuff mm. because you get used to playing like loose and then come the real games when everyone is like sweating way harder you're not like as cohesive as you need to be in a really good lobby if that makes sense because yeah. in scrims everyone's just running around i actually just want to pick up on that point a little bit it kind of detracts from the, the topic but you mentioned you know scrimming in in china lobbies for instance i believe you also competed in the americas whilst in australia at one point as well right mm -hmm in almost any other game or any other esport it would be almost unheard of to be playing you know on that sort of ping yeah how the fuck do you manage to do it in <laughs> PUBG, and is it actually playable uh it's a bit like rock paper scissors in PUBG because the hit reg is all client side so it's like if i'm 1v1ing a guy and i peek and on his screen he unpeaks i still see him on my screen i can just gun him and then on his screen he dies around the corner so it's a bit like uh it's not that competitive um but I mean, the good teams will still prevail. So like, I don't expect the best team to win online tournaments every single time, just based on those like RNG factors that are just random deaths. But I think that the teams that would qualify to land will still qualify. So I'm kind of okay with people playing out of region. Like for example, the online tournaments we play in America at the moment, I think the average ping of the players is like 80. If you were to just tally up everyone's across the board, which mm -hmm. is like, it sucks. And it's annoying to play against, but then the good teams that have good positions will still make what about those darn aussies that you have to play against when they're on 200 ping when you're playing against them now in america like do you notice it when you go up against like a flood or a luke or whatever yeah instantly it's so obvious and like you will we'll comment like we'll say in our <laughs> voice chat we'll be like ping guy here like just so the team knows that if i pick this guy i need to be like really quick so i don't get like clapped mm -hmm. through the wall yeah. yeah you spoke a little bit about um the lack of org involvement for nations cup we'll, we'll chat about the sonics because they've been a big part of your life now really over the, mm -hmm. the last five six years or however long um i guess sort of just talk us through what they've been able to do for you because sometimes the outside don't get to see a lot of the positives from orgs they kind of just see everything on face value but like i know they've been absolutely life-changing for you yeah obviously um bizzle the ceo he always says like sonics is the org royale back-to-back -back champions 
because uh, a lot of the orgs left PUBG at one point and then they come back but like he was, he's just been there since the start and uh, basically I mean when I first got the offer so I was 19 I just dropped out of uni to go um, he got me a PC an office internet and a small studio apartment uh, all of that was like paid for by the Sonics and then I got my salary on the side and that was like exactly what I needed to get started if that makes sense so I could just grind mm. every day I'd literally wake up walk to the gym walk to the PC stream scrim go back home and that was like really conducive I think to me A getting good at the game um, building you know friendships with my teammates because they also moved there um, and just grinding stream hours so like I don't think I ever would have been able to get to where I'm at right now without that kind of opportunity given to me like if you look at my average viewers since I started streaming it's like dwindling dwindling and then the day I move to America it's like poof, it's like yeah. in the next month just triple and then triple again because I'm on the right time zone and all that so I guess in some ways it's not really like a um, normal org player situation it's almost like a family for you and you probably feel like you, you want to repay them I guess throughout your journey as a pro player and, and does that make you want to succeed more for the Sonics considering like they took a chance on you basically a massive chance on you mm -hmm. um so it's not like a situation where sometimes you see so many players just can come and go certain orgs you signed a six-month contract or whatever but yeah. for you it's almost like this this permanent thing yeah i think that like t like tiggleton and sonics are like synonymous like yeah everyone knows that us two go together and uh i've had teams want to buy me out over the course of my career like there was a chance i could have been like liquid diggleton at one point stuff like that but uh no one ever really would have given me the same support that I think Bizzle did. Like yeah. when COVID started, he literally said like, you're going to move into my place. So he set my PC up in his living room and I just streamed from his living room for like, you know, three months straight while yeah. everything was in quarantine. Like, I don't think anyone else would have done that for me. Uh, I think then when you say get an offer from a liquid or whatever, it's sort of like, even if that offer is better than your current deal or whatever, it's almost like is taking that little extra worth it considering what sonics have actually gone and done for me like when it's probably that minuscule I, but it, is it then also difficult for you because you almost feel like you can't leave even if you you know don't want to necessarily say three four five years down the track or whatever it's almost like at, at what point how how would you even go about that i know it's probably difficult for me to, to even ask let alone for you to answer but because they've done so much for you you've been a part of them for so long do you feel like it's it's sonics or bust or would you envision a world in which say five years was it a long time from now nothing anything recent where you would say okay maybe it's time for a fresh you know fresh home uh yeah maybe if, with a new game like I, I think as long as PUBG is a thing it doesn't really make any sense to not be on the Sonics yeah um I remember Bizzle said to me this was ages ago he was like when I when he started this org he wants people that bleed teal he just wants people in the org that are like loyal to the org and want to grow and do all that stuff like be a family he wanted that kind of person on the team and i guess i that stuck with me i remember him saying that do you, do you get that from the siege team do you, do you feel like the siege sonics team bleed teal uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh i mean maybe at the start super of the year does. um super yeah have you interacted much with super yeah super's a homie i play poker with him like every week oh really yeah yeah no, he's a he's a character though I think is, he, character. Is, he, is, is he a character off camera as much as he is on camera and no, uh, I mean, uh, no streamer is as much of a character as they are, but he's, he's quite chill. He doesn't really talk that much off camera. When we're playing poker, you know, he's happy to sit there and just play the hands. He'll go 30 minutes without talking, you know? And I think if I told that to his regular viewers, they'd be like... <laughs> <laughs> well, at one point, there was also two gunners in the organization. Yeah. As well. Yeah. One for gunners. Siege, one for PUBG. I think one for PUBG. Well, he just got dropped, so... Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess... I hate to say it, but we, my team actually called that. The PUBG team, we called that he would probably get dropped. Really? What's it like having Gunner <laughs> on, on the Russell since when you got him? Obviously, you had um, Sologic for a long time. Yeah. Well, Machine Gunner, so our coach, is a ex-Marine, obviously, for those that don't know him. Um, and he's a very good disciplinarian. He has a lot of life lessons. And uh, I was talking to him pretty recently, and he said, like, my goal is not to change you as a player. My goal is to change you as a man. And I think that that was like a really good quote. He focuses a lot on our mentality and our confidence. And he brings a lot of the lessons from the military into our games. So he talks about like unit cohesion or like one of my favorite sayings from him is embrace the suck. You know, sometimes things are shitty mm. and 
aren't perfect and you just have to embrace that <laughs> that's like one of my favorite quotes from him so he's more of a manager he's mm, more of a mental coach i'd say right I mean, that's probably yeah good way to put it obviously he's um been around a long long time originally with you know the shoot to kill guys for i think the majority of his career yeah. actually he's the only coach to have made every level championship wow it's a fucking good achievement <laughs> well done gonna shout out um yeah the um sonics r6 team they had a, they had their opportunity in atlanta to do something we thought they'd do a little bit a little bit better have, have you like played much r6 at all because obviously like you know they're pretty big in in rainbow six as well and you'd be hanging around with the guys and super and stuff have you just played it for fun um yeah a little bit throughout my time just, not for you i enjoy it it's very similar to PUBG with like the lean mechanics so I yeah think I'm pretty good at it <laughs> lean, but uh lean spam yeah i don't know i just think it's like i'd rather just play counter-strike at that point yeah it's i feel like whenever i play siege i'm always like thinking about the verticality difference between cs where in cs everything's just that horizontal clearing everything horizontally and in siege you got to look up at the ceiling down at the floor as well mm -hmm. um it's definitely difficult to get into have you watched much of it though like at all especially yeah, like yeah. if sonics are at one of the the majors or whatever yeah of course we've watched a bunch of it and i think that that was quite interesting like that's why my team was kind of like confused they just have a very different like team environment to us like when we watch them play and they win around they all sit there ah! some of them like grixie will just pound his desk or something and i'm just like damn like, like you shouldn't like celebrate till you've won the match you know what i mean like <laughs> so it's just a totally different environment i find it interesting like gunner was like so hype like one of my favorite quotes from him was like uh they won around and i think he said like everything will go great for us it was something like that and like you could just barely hear it like through the camera like while it was recording them. i was like like that's a really interesting thing to say so yeah so we'll transition to something that's less to do with you more to do with probably us commentary casting because mm -hmm. i think you've had i think i've seen you make some comments regarding like casters or commentary I, in fact i found a very positive one about you i was oh really i was stalking the feed yeah oh, yeah bit of a glaze bit of a glaze yeah yeah not that it not that it counted for much in the end <laughs> I'm not even the actually. tickleton uh yeah vouch was enough what, what's your i think we'll keep this strictly to maybe PUBG because obviously mm -hmm. like everything external is like whatever you don't know as much about like you, it's hard to critique like a cs caster like you only play it so casually right but as a pro PUBG player um and, and this is not like to, to shit on anyone i i'm very good friends with pretty much every single PUBG talent um that we've got there's not many left but good friends with all of them but i, I kind of want your thoughts on it when you kind of go back and you watch it do you feel as if for a lack of a better word it's gotten a bit stale over the last couple of years me included uh <clears throat> well i didn't watch much of the casting of this event in thailand but in general for like a lot of the online events um and for some of the pgs events i just feel like the too much goes unsaid and unnoticed i don't know when i'm a pro player and i'm watching it, i'm always like oh my god this team's doing this because of this and like i feel like i have like this good insight into the game and then i feel like the casters don't like pick up on a lot of things or like read the kill feed correctly a lot of time just minor mistakes like that kind of upset me it definitely has gotten a little stale but that's i actually think the whole viewing experience of PUBG is stale at the moment mm. PUBG needs like apex's command center where you can tune into any team and yep. listen to their comms at any given moment that's like that should be like the basis of battle royale broadcasting in general because that's how you build personality like when you watch a PUBG tournament and you see new happy cc 108 and like you're like who is this guy i like i don't know him there's no media about him never heard his comms like you, how are you supposed to build like a fan to play a connection if that makes sense yep and i think that's why apex does so well as an esport is because people watch like dark zero in these clutch moments and then they see jen burton like yeah and then they're just like oh that's actually sick you know what i mean like it's exciting yeah. it's way more personable like back in the og og days like i'm talking 2018 when i first got into PUBG and i was doing like the in game observing along with the casting and like i had to fly around and like doing it all by myself plus production my goal originally at the time was like i've got to find a way to like talk about 16 teams and like see what 16 teams are doing all at once and like that's very fucking difficult like it's really hard and as you said like you miss certain things and that's sometimes not like a skill issue as a caster that's just simply like there's too much going on yeah you can't grab everything and sometimes if you try to grab everything you then talk about everything at a surface level whereas if you hone in on something specific you can go a little bit more in depth so it's kind of like very difficult um and it's interesting that you say that because like i think that's one of the biggest issues in PUBG is you can't get everything 
And then you as a player will also see very different things to what say, a caster would, would see. And I think then that brings me to the main talking point about this is the lack of X players or even the lack of player involvement in terms of like the English casting talent, like on a desk level or as a caster. Like, why have we just not seen... Because pubg has been around a long time now. Outside of God uh, Godspeed, who makes sure everyone knows he's an ex-player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's been a long time. Outside of Godspeed, like, there's, there's, like, we should have seen more players become talent, right? Uh, yeah, totally. I completely agree. And I think that a lot of PUBG players aren't, like, that personable. So that's why they don't move into casting. Um, we, uh, this is some feedback that we actually gave to Craft and PDC. Uh, and we're looking to fix it for next year. We said Apex Command Center and also if I've qualified through the group stage and now it's the loser's bracket or if I get eradicated, eradicated, eliminated, <laughs> eliminated at some point, like as a player and personality that people recognize, I should be brought on the desk to do analysis with like Avenger and some of the other casters just because like people are going to tune in or you could literally bring like two players. Like imagine, you know, you're watching the desk and then Gustav from FaZe and I come up. Mm. People are going to be like, oh, this is going to be good. Like there's some banter here. Like it's going to be nice. I think that that kind of thing would level up the production a lot just to involve the players on the desk a little bit sometimes. That was, I was literally going to propose that. I was like in a eSport, like a, any battle royale, right? Teams get knocked out or qualified or whatever. They, they're sitting there waiting to for the rest of the event. Yeah. So you may as well uh, use them. I, I mean... We talked a little bit about you know try casting in esports in general is that something you you know outside of the desk like actual in-game casting do you think that you or you know other personable um t uh, players would be able to bring like that that analysis and, and integrate into the broadcast and actually provide that value and maybe point out the things that casters might be missing for instance i think analysis would be so easy like that would just be absolutely chill the hardest part would be not swearing um, <laughs> for sure <laughs> um yeah like that, that would just be the most difficult part for sure but is that one Australian. thing that sometimes because like obviously players are very vocal I, I, and fans alike fail to sometimes realize how difficult it actually is to be a caster like mm -hmm. as critical as um it, you can be because they we all make mistakes we're human we will we'll, we'll fuck up or we won't talk about things or general uh, game knowledge won't obviously be as good as the pros but then the eloquence to talk and have that on-camera personability and be able to obviously string sentences together and talk about all the action for essentially 30 minutes non-stop like there are players that have the knowledge but can't then do the casting right yeah no that's absolutely true i think that it's a skill like i think i'm pretty good at talking i can waffle for a bit you know that's mm. part of being a live streamer but even today we sat in front of this it's not even live and i was like how, how do I wear this? How really do I talk? Quick? Yeah, how do I speak? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely an underrated skill. And um, I think they're bringing that energy as well. Like, yeah. whenever you watch the casters, you know, you don't actually get to see them when you're watching the stream. But if you get to see them, like, in person or a video of them, they'll watch be the there jumping, whatever. hands on the head. Like, they get very animated and they bring the energy. Yeah, was it, was it Captain Flowers, was it? The League of Legends caster who was like, world, yeah. slamming the desk and, like, <laughs> he was like shaking like full on having a fucking shake and like obviously we do the same thing as well and like there's been times where you know i'll be I, like we would stand especially during the more impactful moments and stuff i think i'd love to have like a player like if i'm casting like let's say it's like me and paper thin and then we got you in for at least just like the first 10 15 minutes just to talk about like the the, the rotations the early phase stuff what teams are doing what players are doing something might catch your eye and then after that if you dip that's fine because then at, after 15 minutes has elapsed and teams are, you know we're getting to phase four and five and stuff and there's a lot more fighting you probably don't need that like super in-depth analysis now there's a lot going on where you're mm -hmm. moving from fight to fight so like even if you were to just be like jo joining in for the first 10 15 minutes i think that would be such a a positive so imagine you have a world where you've got like one or two players on the desk you got one player part of the casting team and then they kind of leave after 10 15 minutes i think that's a really good way one developing the players to be able to do this because like where's the developmental pathway for the players because you say like um a lot of them maybe wouldn't be able to be casters or have the ability to do it it's like how can we give them an opportunity how can we actually let them try like, I, like at the end of the day like i missed out on every single global event this year that's fine i don't give a shit like it's i mean i give a shit a little bit <laughs> but like, don't cap. if it's gonna happen i would rather at least like i'm missing out because like fucking players are getting in and shit mm -hmm. instead of it just being like oh we're gonna cut the budget and like this is not that good so that's the worry for me is that maybe the people who are in charge of this aren't even thinking about bringing players in and then that's just worse for the viewers because like at the end of the day it's such a difficult game to convey and the viewers need as much information as possible who better to trust 
than the pros themselves. Like, yeah. So we did bring it up. So if it happens, then is this something you would do? Uh, like, would you like think about like? Yeah, they, they they said that to us in a meeting. That was like their rebuttal was like, oh, where we know that a lot of the players focus on the exact wording was their condition during the tournament, um, and probably would say no if we invited them to come cast and mm. be an analyst. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'd love to do that. Yeah. What about like full blown Xenox level commentary, play by play, like bringing that energy, or would you be just more like the color? I would just be there like doing yeah. analysis post game, probably. Yeah, cool. I mean, on the desk or actually in in the game, which would you prefer? I'd be down to do some in game stuff, but I, I'm pretty good at stumbling over my words sometimes, or just dropping a casual fuck. Fuck. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe maybe not. De desk is a little bit more like this. Yeah, so I think the desk would be a piece of cake. I think that the yeah. in-game casting, it would be hard to like not speak over each other or like... Yeah. The, the other thing as well, like when you're in-game, you're the, the two casters are the ones that are like fully in control of everything. When you're on the desk, you've got a host that's basically just feeding you questions and tri you know, trivial, trivial yeah. points anyway. So it's, all hand it's definitely it? a little bit more easier, I think, to integrate some of the players onto the desk, which like, fuck's sake, we had um, for PGC this year, a host and one analyst. Like, I was so disappointed, man. Like, I was watching the event, and it's literally just Toffee's an Avenger. And it's just, it looks so cheap. And I get that, obviously, for PUBG, the English commentary and, like, the Western audience is not nowhere near comparable to the East. But, like, you still want to put on it, like, a good front. Like, just add one extra analyst. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know. I, f I feel like a lot of the casters and analysts these days just have insane rates, probably. <sighs> yes and no. I mean, like... I think that the issue is, um, like, I'm just trying to think of, like, Dubai and stuff. It's, it depends on what you consider insane. But I can tell you this right now. It's, like, nowhere near comparable to, like, Counter-Strike, for example, right? Like, it's not at that level. I'd, I'd say the rates in PUBG are probably comparable to, like, Rainbow Six. And I think PUBG itself um, does better than Rainbow Six in terms of overall viewership, but not Western viewership yep. so in terms of the English stream. So can you justify having a full-blown English cast of, like, 10 people now when on twitch i can i think it gets like 20k views for the, like the english stream is that worth it like probably not probably so not. you do want obviously downgraded a little bit but then it just looks quite cheap i think they just needed one more talent just have it host two analysts four casters and you, you're pretty much set mm -hmm. because you obviously need to rotate the casters i think that um in terms of the actual commentary in PUBG, and like i'm happy to talk about it because i got to watch a little bit of pgc this year and i love all those guys and it's me included like a little bit of self-reflection for me missing out on all of the um global event work this year it was sort of like which me missing out on that work has zero effect on like micro casting unfortunately that's just the world we live in like it's not like oh xenox we're not going to give you the work because you're a shit caster now it's just not how it works I, I'm, I'm probably not going to go too in depth as to the reasons why i missed out this year but it's basically got nothing to do with me unfortunately and that's where it sucks the most is it's like i yeah. can't do anything like mm -hmm. i tried super hard this year to stay involved do a lot of the apac stuff which got completely canned like we lost all the pcs apac everything got split yeah obviously there's no like english cov coverage of like thailand vietnam so i lost a lot of that like local work and so therefore then i then miss out on pgs1 and then you know i'm speaking to crafton and i'm like well i'm kind of fucked now because like i have no way of actually like proving myself and they're like oh no no, no it's fine and then is that on pgs2 and then they cut pnc and then i'm like hey pgc's around the corner and then no reply and obviously start to get the writing on the wall um and i think looking back and in, in terms of self-reflection i think back last year 2022 21 it's like have i put the effort in to warrant being a solidified member of that like international english casting team and i don't think so i think probably got a little bit lazy just because pubg is the kind of game it hasn't changed that much realistically like there has been changes and i think if you really focus in on what those changes are compared to like 2018 2019 etc there certainly has been but nothing too crazy where like a league of legends for example has um so many different patches and changes mm -hmm. and champions that come out or even rainbow six with all of its operators and new maps and things like that um well, that's kind of my problem is I, I think a lot of casters have that mindset and that's why like you know it feels like they're still talking about it like it's 2018 yeah and yeah I don't think that a lot of the casters these days, like obviously no disrespect. I don't think a lot of them see No, there's no disrespect to any of the cast. Like they're all great. They all work hard. But I think for me, and sorry to cut you off there, but 
everyone that's working now was like super amazing in 2018 2019 all had good knowledge because everyone was playing the fucking game as well back then yeah. right so and it's just kind of like me included i think we've all just kind of like stayed at that that level as you're kind of saying yeah that's kind of what i mean there's no like new talent coming up I, I it feels like the there's no like replaceable factor mm. like a lot of people will improve at their job and consistently put in effort when like there's someone there to replace them but i feel like when there's no one there to replace them they're just like oh I'm yeah you know yeah and i feel like a lot of the casters kind of feel irreplaceable at this point because they've been around for so long yeah i think um bringing it to siege it's a little different where like i've grinded the fuck out of trying to improve as a caster in siege one because the opportunities are there especially locally pays the bills you're going to give me events i'm going to work harder to obviously continue to do those events but then there's also more of that grind to then eventually get like majors and six invitationals and stuff so that kind of keeps us wanting to improve with PUBG for a while it was just sort of like yeah i'm gonna get this i'm gonna get that like i don't really need to you know do much more and then this year i'm sort of like okay actually now i want to do more i want to get better i want to improve but i'm not getting given anything like i've done two PUBG tournaments this year mm -hmm. lpl PUBG, and okay. one pcr mm -hmm. because for the first pcr and i'll happily say they offered me a hundred dollars for the yeah. first pcr I can't take that like that's just not like you can't do that as a caster first and foremost it's just selling yourself short and i said to, to PUBG, i said look i can't I'm, i can't accept that like that's just ridiculous you can't offer me but for what it's worth PUBG didn't offer me 100 the people who were running that tournament yeah so that's the thing PUBG always employs uh people to run the tournaments like yeah when it comes to budgets and those decisions like i think PUBG sets a budget and then it's up to that organizer but that PUBG do set they, they give a list of who they want casting mm-hmm yeah, well, yeah. That, that would make sense. Which obviously I was either not on that list, which I don't think I was, for what it's worth, mm -hmm. for this year, um, or I just wasn't selected for maybe the first one or something. But as the year went on, I don't even think I was on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm happy to speak openly about it because I think um, I want to continue to do PUBG, but it's so fucking hard because I've got nothing to cast. Like, yeah. how, how do I, as a caster now, try to improve and be like, you know what, I want to workshop this, I want to get better, I want to get caught up 2023 going into 2024 know the meta know everything about the game as it is now refresh do a bit of a workshop go into next year with a, a sort of a blank state how do you even do that like that's the thing like i'm not going to go cast scrims no offense but like i've got other work like i got work that pays the bills mm -hmm. like i got other titles that will give me money to work those titles if PUBG's not giving me the work is it worth me putting the time in then to actually get better and that's the other part of it for all of the talent is there is it worth it You've got Paper Thin now doing Valorant. Like, so obviously he's getting big gigs doing Valorant. Uh, uh, you have obviously Pansy and Hypoc who went massive in Valorant. You're getting all this work. Like, is it worth then putting the effort into PUBG? Uh, well, at this point, obviously no. <laughs> uh, I mean, Paper Thin does well to balance it, but it feels like it's just there to But even fill... he, I've seen critique for him for the first time this year. On PUBG? Like, as in like PUBG fans critiquing Paper Thin's knowledge and that he hasn't kept up with the game the mm. way he has, has done previously that's not me saying yeah. that that's what yeah, i've seen yeah, comments yeah, yeah. I, I mean that's interesting i've always liked paper thin because i think that he was the best caster at keeping up with the players yeah i don't think any other casters put in the same amount of effort to understand the player's personality and play styles mm. that's also why i liked you as a caster and why i vouched for you on twitter maybe that's like some australian bias but i thought that you always gave the players a personality like whenever you used to spectate scrims even especially when I back was in 18 the day. Yeah, you would yeah. be like tiggy the flexer yeah knowing that that my whole brand was like the flex gang yeah. like that whole meme you used to just have like like personality stuff like that yeah. whereas like now it's like there's i don't think i, I think everything just lacks personality mm. to be honest yeah which is kind of sad yeah i think it's it's a it's an interesting state because it's like people want the casters to improve but if it's not worth it they're not going to and if it is worth it and as you said if there's like you know if they're replaceable for example if there's up and coming talent that are going to like overtake them or ex players then suddenly that might kick a bit of a, a fire into some to improve again like i'm not shitting on any of them i i actually think the casters in PUBG are good casters like from the casting technical perspective i'm just purely talking from a more analytical game state perspective as to where PUBG is at right now I think all of us again including myself have probably dropped the ball the last two three years a little bit in, in keeping up and i think a lot of the players probably have that sentiment yeah and uh i mean 
if you're honest about it, like the, the viewership on PUBG dips like 30% every single time the match ends because no one wants to sit there to watch the desk anymore. No one cares about mm. the desk. And people are so habitually seeing the end of the match, closing the tab, doing something else, and then 10 minutes later opening it up again. Yeah. Because it's just uninteresting at this point. Yeah. Do you, do you get um, like at the events? Oh, I'll say this year because obviously I wasn't at any of the events, but throughout this year, did you get any talent come up to you and be like, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Or like, what do you think of this? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty social. So like I would go to the pool every morning and all the talent would be there and we would yeah. swim. So like we sure, would just Avenger, talk about Toby, they're all there every morning. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, but that's not the same as like the only talent that has ever really walked up to me on stage and been like, I have this question, this question, and this question, and then written about it, uh, Toffees and WTF Moses in MPL. Okay. No one else ever walks up and asks questions to the players like directly on stage. Yeah, I've, I've, I can vouch for that too because I see Toffees always with his little notebook. Toffees, it's quite funny because he's such a big guy and he's got this tiny yeah. little notebook. He's Mr. Incredible. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he's great. He puts actually... And, and see, this is the thing because I don't want this to come out as like a bashing the talent thing. They're all, they're all great. I think it, it's more just a collective for me that I think if I could get everyone in the same room be like, all right, me included again, I always keep saying that, but like, let's try and maybe refresh a little bit in terms of knowledge and like keeping up, do some workshops with some players, some teams and be like, hey, help me out. Like what's going on with the meta, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, couldn't agree more really. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll leave it with that. We'll, we'll, um, we, we kind of dragged it on. Again, repeat, I love all of you PUBG talent, every single one of you. <laughs> gonna, disclaimer. Disclaimer. It's going to get clipped out of context. It's probably going to get You're completely fucked. You are never working PUBG again. Ever. Well, I didn't fucking work it this year. Yeah, so, so you cooked. Um, so Xenox might not have a future in PUBG, but hopefully you will in, I guess, five-ish years time. Where do, you, where do you see yourself? Are you, I guess, outlining those plans now or are you sort of just playing it by ear? Uh, people keep asking me this question at the moment. It's like the third time I've gotten to this <laughs> week. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. it's too ambiguous. I can't make a plan because I don't even know what game I'm going to be playing. I don't know what org I'm going to be on, where I'm going to be living. It's too hard to be like, yeah, I'll go into coaching or like, yeah, I'll go into management. Um, I could always go back to school. Not ideal. Uh, hopefully in the next five years, I can make enough money that I can just start investing and then just like check out of having to do anything nine to five mm. write that off but uh it's a really difficult question i don't see myself not competing that's the toughest thing for me at this point i mean i'm still very young i'm only 23 so i have a decent you know shelf life in front of me but i feel like I in just... five years like when you're 28 that's when you'd be like five years from now <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, know I mean? yeah like, exactly the next five years you're going to still be grinding yeah. basically but i guess maybe then in 10 years <laughs> would you prefer to be living in america or australia ah oh, australia without a doubt uh, like no questions asked i will be moving back here at some point like even if like so this is where it's interesting because obviously the benefits of being in america from a streaming perspective still like in terms of time zones audience playing the, the fucking game so you're not like on high ping you can play games like PUBG, which arguably are dead in australia but like alive in america like you've got to factor in all of that though right Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, and the, you know, it's like a dollar fifty AU on the US dollar at the moment. So like, it's, it's absolutely the place to be until I retire. So yeah. I, I just love Australia though, like Melbourne, especially like growing up around home. here is just, it's home. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to be fair, at least, um, it's getting a little bit better here. You can get much better infrastructure in terms of your oh, yeah. internet and stuff. <laughs> um, you, a lot of content creators are actually moving to Melbourne as well away from sydney yeah, which i mean there's been like a great up. exodus yeah. away from sydney to, to really? melbourne recently it's a lot more yeah. advanced here as well now so yeah, look it's not that bad um but i think for me it'll always be the factor that there's just like certain games you can't play in australia that you can play elsewhere like in america like you can pretty much play in america 24 7 yep. hop on at 5 a.m and you can play PUBG probably yep. <laughs> so that's always for me like the the biggest thing that kind of sucks about being in australia and then the, the ping as well i mean you can always play like a asia servers but it sucks that's crazy if you think about like the English speaking demographic that's in the Australian time zone, it's just, you know, the 30 odd million people that are in Australia compared to if I stream on East Coast US, I hit Europe. Most people speak English in Europe and I also get all of America. And it's like, you, that's, that, that's like a billion people yeah. right there. That are Even English South speaking. America really mm. isn't. A lot of South Americans watch my stream too. And that's like, that is my whole audience on Twitch. You know, if I stream at like 10 a.m. my time, yeah. I get Europe, I get America, and that's when I peak viewership. 
in Austin. All right, so fuck it. We'll do it live a little bit here just because we're vibing out. We've kind of hit pretty much most of the points. I want to ask, what's it like dealing with hate? It's a, it's a strange question. It is a strange question. Because probably not everyone wants to talk about it because it's a bit... Um, firstly, it's personable because everyone reacts to it differently. But I think it's an interesting thing to bring up because as a caster, we get hate. Like we get we fucking cop it just as much as really... Probably not as much as you, obviously. But the amount of times, like it, it's almost normal to just be like these cars, like typing in chat, these cars suck ass, these guys are shit or whatever. Yeah. Like I've got, we get DMs as well. Um, Wait, what? I, I, I've got DMs. I haven't. I must be. I must actually be good. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't think I have, unless I haven't seen it. I, I've copped some DMs, um, <laughs> and it's you know it's not fun because like in some ways like we're only human, and like some of the shit that I was seeing in PGC, death threats, people. Yeah, like, well, not for me, obviously. But for you were there. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. Fatigue. Um, and just the shit that people would say. And it's like, does like does that not... Does, not that it gets to you, because I know it doesn't get to you, but like dealing with that, going from someone who was relatively unknown to now where you are, has that been something you've had to deal with? Yeah. I always kind of think about it like there's haters and there's, there's fans and they're mm. always going to be, you know, there's always going to be both and uh for the most part like in in person my experience in person Fine. is i only meet fans yeah uh, no one has ever expressed any level of like resentment or anything towards me in person um so it's like it's all just twitter fingers you know it's characters online mm -hmm. i always tell myself that but like i have had a lot of dms and like it's frustrating how people just like try to interject themselves into my life in like some way like people say like i'll find you at these events or like yeah i've been sent videos of like really gory horrific things people saying like i'm gonna do this to you like i'll find you and even like as far as like if i follow a girl on social media fans from other teams will dm that girl like dirt about me and like just try and like blemish my image just because i followed them you know what i mean so mm. it's like it's really frustrating having these people just like really intercept like every part of my life like i was sitting down in thailand for example having lunch and i was sitting completely alone i just finished gym i was in a tank top and then one of the workers at the event saw that i was sitting alone she came and she was like oh i'll sit with you if you don't mind i was like sure so i sit there and then some fan took a photo of us through a bush sitting together jesus christ what and the it got fuck? posted on uh, weibo which is like yeah. chinese twitter yeah. and they were saying like all this like sexual stuff towards her like she had two ponytails they were like double the ponytails double the attack speed like Fuck just me. stuff like that and i'm just like just let a man eat his lunch <laughs> like yeah. well, you know like it's kind of out of pocket so I, I don't like a lot of that stuff and like you know i don't really talk about what i do a lot with people that i meet in person mm. and my private instagram is just like i have one photo on it it's like yeah you know i don't really Did, i don't uh, enjoy that part of it somewhat. does that upset you in some ways that you almost can't be as uh open about your private life because you feel like you you have to keep that closed yeah i mean i think that that's like a realization that i had because you know i used to be very open with my whole twitch about my private life i didn't really care mm. and now i'm like tight lip on everything i don't like talking about it anything i do with anyone and i don't like going outside at events if i'm with a friend or something just because people will make assessments and i just don't like it it feels like people judge me and like kind of scrutinize everything i do i think that um yeah it's it's interesting because like even just having private life be public i'm at a point where obviously i'm nowhere near as um noticeable as you or have that sort of notoriety um, but like I'll post pictures of like my wife or retweet some things that she might say and like I've had people in, in like if I'm playing a game or whatever and because like I might have my Twitter uh -huh. in Steam like they'll say something about Laura or whatever and like you think then should I be like posting things because there was for a while I was kind of like I don't really want to but then I'm like you know this is still like something you should be proud of and like you want to obviously you know share something <laughs> that's I, I an interesting balance so i went through that completely with my ex-girlfriend she was always like post me on your like tingleton instagram and i was always like no yeah. hell no <laughs> uh, rocky waters yeah. yeah and like i'm just kind of like sometimes I, I i think of a day where like you know if i'm posting pictures of like my son or something and like what if someone like i play a game against someone or whatever i fucking flog them in cs or something and they go on my twitter and then they like like 
even if it's just words online you're still like like you don't want that like you know so then you kind of want to keep that back a little bit like i don't really like posting pictures of like my son on my twitter because like, i don't really want that to be public firstly for him because it's you know it's not fair. i don't like the fact that people like blast their kids on social media and shit like yeah, I think yeah. it's kind of fucked up a little bit but like um you think of like the ramifications of like what people can do and say and like obviously like i i'm a caster so i get a pretty thick skin like i can pretty much deal with a lot of shit that's been said towards me or about me or whatever but you still don't like seeing it yeah and i guess that's probably the same for you it's like it doesn't really affect you but it's still kind of like fuck i have to deal with this shit i mean some things could affect me like i remember one time i needed some screws because i was assembling a pc on stream and i said like oh there's like a this hardware store it's 2.7 miles away and <laughs> oh no someone like referencing knowing that i lived in philadelphia and in an apartment building did like a radius check and like found that like my apartment building was the only one that matched that like radius away from the hardware fucking, store yeah. and was like i know you live here i got a dm that was like that and i was like <sighs> jesus like <laughs> i've had that happen before as well i've been doxxed i mean actually yeah yeah on discord i think i think they use like uh oh, i won't say what it was but yeah they, they had a method of finding out where the fuck i lived and it was like jesus it's scary isn't it like, I, like honestly i wasn't that scared i was like it, it, like you kind of said right in person 99 percent of people if not 100 percent, are going to be mm. positive right um and no one really acts on what they, they say but it is still a little bit unnerving and like you said it doesn't really affect you but it's like just because i'm a, a commentator on this game or a player or whatever i shouldn't be subjected to this it's just degenerate behavior yeah i think it also detracts away from good fans too right like because yeah. like sometimes you've got um fans that are very nice they do things and like they're very supportive and such is the world i feel like negativity always just like takes the spotlight doesn't it right like mm. so then it's hard to like interact with the good fans because you feel like then if you give them a lot then the haters will feel like they've got a way of like also getting your attention well how do you sort of balance that do you like almost then not shut down the good fans but like do you not then get too involved uh it depends on the person obviously but I, this is actually interesting so it's funny you say that because like if i'm reading twitch chat i will notice myself doing this and catch myself intentionally because i'm aware that it's like a thing I can read like 10 messages saying like, you're the best, love you, you're the best. And then I'll see one person that just types some like dumb out of pocket thing and I'll start reading it and then I'll be like, why did I choose to respond to this one <laughs> instead of the five positive comments before it? It's yeah. really easy to focus on the one that pisses you off and be like, shut the fuck up, idiot. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's just really important that like you don't confuse the two and let it like spoil <laughs> I, the experience for others. I have to ask is like, we've all, um commented in streamers chats and things like that especially those that are quite popular have you ever spoken to x have you i ever, have you, have you, have you, i saw my twitch recap and i think i had sent several hundred messages in xqc's uh, chat has he ever responded <laughs> no <he's, laughs> i'm a parasocial peter so, so what's that like obviously i think you fucking had like 4k views the other day or something as well and when you've got a chat that's just popping off it's hard to catch all the comments yeah and it's interesting people will sometimes type something without adding me and then they'll be like you're not reading my comments mm. and i'm like that's an interesting actual question i have is um you know sometimes popular streamers will talk about this where maybe they enjoyed back in the day where they had you know 50 viewers or whatever and it was more personable and you could actually have these interactions obviously having more viewerships more revenue and more excitement whatever and that has its own perks as well but is there a part of you perhaps that does miss when you had less of viewership and it did feel maybe a little bit more interactive with your chat um somewhat but i mean the chatters that i would be interactive with i'm still going to be interactive with it just takes longer to develop those relationships i think because it's like harder for me to interact with them mm. but like I, for example last time i went back to philadelphia i just caught up for lunch with one of my viewers because he was like seen you coming to philly come to lunch i was like okay let's see just stuff like that like i enjoy doing stuff like that because like that's just community building and it's really like yeah it's fun to see the effects that you have on people in person rather than just be like a name on the screen so i don't think it's that much harder to like develop the interaction it's easier that you don't have to like read chat as fast it's not as like mentally taxing because it's really hard to commit things to memory and remember usernames and people when it's and you try to play PUBG at the same time yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. so sometimes i'll read a message i won't even realize who typed it and then i'll go back and i'll be like oh my god <laughs> you know yeah like the amount the amount of times that i've um gone in and just made like a, an offhand comment and then you just don't read it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's like because you're just fucking playing the game or whatever or like you just completely yeah. miss it so like i just like if I like say something random or something um 
And it's like, I feel like, because I'm sitting there like, I know it's not like he's read it and he's ignored me. I'm like, ah, oh, he, he... But it's tilting. It's it's not tilting per se, but it's <laughs> I like... I find it tilting. If it happens to me, I'm like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I, I understand. But I feel like there's maybe some viewers that don't understand. And they feel like, why is he not like responding to me? But then it's also like, if you've just joined for the first time and you say something, like the odds of you reading that out and responding back to them when you've got now like 4K viewers is very fucking low. And that's not because like you've got an ego or you haven't you know you haven't read it or whatever it's just really hard to respond to now every single comment and also you're playing the game i mean yeah especially like sometimes i'll have no caffeine in me or something and i'm struggling to just focus on the game and play well let alone read chat i'm like oh and then like that's what it's the worst i can go like five minutes without reading chat and then i'll yeah. be like oh shit i need to read chat like <laughs> and i think for some streamers that when they get to like this jinxie read these Twitch chat? Like this. I mean, I don't think I mean that's, that's right. the thing, right? You're probably just in the sweet spot, right? Where you can actually pick out yeah. messages yeah. and maybe have yeah. a bit more of a conversation. I don't know what the culture on your chat is like if it's like emote spam or actual no, discussion. But those are pretty like it's like pretty timid demographic, so but I mean then you have like, you know, Jinxie, XQC, whatever, Sometimes where the summer. entire the entire chat is just fucking emote spam. Mm -hmm. Like when it gets to that point you wouldn't even bother really i guess. It feels like you've just got bots in your chat. You're not actually like interacting with real human beings. I feel like that would be Almost sad in some respect. You might have like 40k viewers. Uh, I'm but... sure. I'm sure he'd rather have the 100k subs. Yeah, he could wipe, <laughs> yeah. wipe his tears with the with the bank notes, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's it's look. It's fascinating because sometimes um, you just don't realize it. And as you said, the sweet spot. You're dealing with someone who um, the chat's not like completely. Like, I'm not going to go bother trying to put a fucking message into XQC no. or Jinxy, which then makes me realize then why are other people fucking putting messages? Yeah, in? Like, I'm like, I think about that sometimes. I just joined in for the like the memes and the emotes. I, I'm not in there asking like, what did you have for fucking lunch? Like, I don't give a shit. I see people make those comments. I know, like, I know, I know, I know. Parasocials. Um, what, what's it like? I guess having a, a sort of level of following where you know, obviously, I guess it's not your full time job being a pro player as well. But like people giving you money and like um, tips and subs and donations and things like that. Do you find that weird? I find it extremely weird. It's one of the weirdest things ever. Like I remember one time I got a thousand dollar donation. I was like, damn. And then someone else was like, uh, another thousand dollars, boom. And then the first guy I donated a thousand was like, no, nah, can't let him show me up. Another thousand dollars, just like three grand in like 10 minutes. And I was just like, <laughs> Why? what the fuck? <laughs> like, I'm a very normal guy. Yeah. I'm not like an exceptional human being out there doing like Mr. Beast work. Like I'm just sitting there playing video games and then these people feel compelled to like give me money. It's very strange to me. Like if entertaining or not, like I, it's never really made sense to me. Although giving is like, so my dad actually, so this is a bit off topic, but like my dad always talks about like how to feel fulfilled in life. And he said that there's like a bunch of different categories. Like, you know, there's like what you make materially, um, you need to like learn, you need to be competitive and giving in charity is like something that you should do as well. Like giving back to like the community. Like those are like off memory. Those are like the four things he talks about. So giving is like an, ex and it's an ex exceptional feeling. I just don't understand like why me, I guess, if that makes sense. No, I understand that. I think even um, as a uh, different level as it is, even like for our patrons, for example, that we've got, you know, sometimes you just sort of like, oh, they're actually giving us money. Like, why <laughs> yeah, right. you know what i mean because like it's um and, and then you imagine it at sort of like the the really high level um sometimes then it's sort of like you see someone like a jinxie that's got a hundred thousand subs you think then why is little timmy going to be like oh i'm going to sub as well it's like this guy's yeah, exactly got money like and the prime subs that's that's the thing that confuses me the most prime subs people use their prime subs on like the biggest streamers and i'm like you could just i do this all the time i just scroll in the directory i find someone with three viewers prime sub to them yeah I don't even know who they are. I'm just like, that, there you go. <laughs> That's very I, humble. I use my prime somewhat excuse, so yeah. I can't. <laughs> Actually, I will say sometimes I juggle it because in, in Rainbow Six, they have like uh, streamer charms, right? So you yeah. can uh, sub for a charm in the game. So I might use my prime for that, but... Um yeah, I think that's probably the better way to go about it. Give it to someone that probably yeah. actually needs it. <laughs> to be fair, SQC does have some emotes, but they got the channel points anyway to like unlock the emotes. I mainly just do it for the ads. I fucking hate ads oh, yeah, on Twitch. Fair, they do fair. my head in. I think you, you can buy, there's like a subscription plan, yeah, yeah. right? If you buy Turbo, it's like 10 bucks a month. No, it used to be that I don't watch enough streamers for it. If to... you were a partner, you didn't get any ads. That was a long time ago now. Though. Do they still well, have I still that? I don't no. see ads. No. I don't see them. I don't understand. Jess, you're lucky. <laughs> have you had a blocker? <laughs> you'll, you'll start, <laughs> Twitch will watch this and you'll start getting ads tomorrow. <laughs> um, funny question here. Very off topic. Do you still use the uh, the Chiefs hoodie in game? 
Uh, I do wear it occasionally because I'm just like that's that's some OG drip, yeah. right? But now we have Sonic skins in the game. Uh. I, feel, I feel a bit weird to not wear the Sonic skins. <laughs> but then I also have this my Saudi prince, my my lovely man that I love so much, <laughs> gifted me this like nice jacket. It was like one of the, like the most expensive jackets in the game at one point. It's so, not like, I also want to wear. Is that, that the player unknown's one? No, no. Oh, the other trench coat one. It's or... called the Wan Yu jacket. It's like some weird Chinese jacket. You need to Did get, you like, see what happened with the um, player unknown mm-hmm. set that uh, <laughs> I, I went and picked up yesterday? <laughs> That's upsetting for a lot of people. If you look at the Steam market price, it's just like zero dollars. Oh, it got like re-released or something, right? Yeah, I did see a tweet about it. The, yeah, ten uh, year anniversary. Everyone whatever, got yeah. it. Every single player got it. All you had to do was log in. <laughs> Nice. Unfortunately, I remember that's... they did that with. There was an old R6 Pro League charm, and they like dropped it really? once. It was like, it's like an OG charm, and I hate that. Like that's frustrating. Yeah. Re releasing items. I mean, it's always a hot topic. I feel like if an in if a game has like a market in game, re releasing items is a big no no. Exactly. Like you don't do that because then it just undermines the market. Out of fucking nowhere as well. Like some guys holding on to like a set, and mm-hmm. like they're just now like, oh, can I'm you have awesome. multiple of the same thing in PUBG, or not? Oh, as in like, yeah. like you could like hoard box? items. Yeah. Like yeah, imagine yeah. you had a collection of them and you yeah, just Yeah, so it was like a little box set that you could keep in your inventory. You yeah, could but could you have like more than one? Yeah, someone probably had like yeah. 10. Yeah, like imagine yeah. you collected 100 I of them. I still got like a PGI ring side set from the first PGI, like the, the box just sitting there. The box, damn. Even though you can't sell it or yeah. do anything with it. It's just like a memorabilia. Yeah, thing. I have the same thing with like the old PCSs. As yeah, well. but um, have so you- have League you... did it right with Championship Riven. They re-released it because everyone wanted it so oh, bad in 2016. Yes. And yeah. I insta-copped it. But like, it's like missing a couple of the VS- VFX that the old one has. So it's like a bit different. I it's do different. have that, that original skin and the... Damn. Um, I mean, I've been playing League since like 2012. So like, obviously I've got a lot but of... But they're also up. not sellable with real money, right? I know there's also third not, party. I know there's yeah, third yeah. party sellers, but... Still yeah. feels like shit. Very It'd be like Counter Strike just bringing out the Dragon Lore again or something. Yeah, It'd be yeah. like what? Yeah. It's like um, World of Warcraft has kind of been doing it with their trading card game original stuff. I don't think either of you play play well, um, but they've kind of been doing something similar where they're releasing a lot of their like old rare items and making it like a Twitch Prime drop, for example. Wait, you said the World of Warcraft trading card game? You mean Hearthstone? No, like legit. It used to be a World of Warcraft trading card game, like proper like. To early you know, mid 2000s or whatever like pokemon like Damn. world of warcraft yeah and you could get like from the card the code is on the card mm. and you can get something in game like i have the um spectral tiger it's worth 10 oh, grand yeah. that's dope yeah and so did you say you don't know if we'd play world of warcraft well yeah you want to see something real quick Hold up. <laughs> random. all right let's do oh fuck little that's frost yeah morn little frost morn <laughs> tell you what okay i'm fast so you do fucking play yeah maybe yeah. he plays more than you probably, nah, probably not anymore do you have a sp- sp- uh, swift spectral tiger no no it's 10 grand 10 grand ten sell grand. your account yeah <laughs> fuck, nah, fuck that <laughs> um I, well, I fucking asked you before in the uh interview if you play other games you said no <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah when i was growing up that's oh, like, was growing like, at the moment i'm like just sweating on PUBG, but yeah I play Dota 2 very occasionally, but... Okay. Are you a little bit of CS? I just feel guilty, because, you know, obviously it's really important that I have my stream hours up on everything, so, like... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I'm fucking... T- I haven't got a tattoo from World of Warcraft. I'm not that. Maybe I'll get a Dead by Daylight tattoo. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> How many hours are you up to on DVD now? Nah, only, like, two and a half. <laughs> Which is not, like... Actually, it's probably my most played game on Steam, but, like, if you were to look at, like, my WoW or RuneScape numbers or some shit, like, it's probably, like, 10k from like the last 15 years of my life you know that's just those kind of games mm-hmm. i think you got like what four and a half in siege pretty sure i just hit 4k on my main but i probably got like five and oh, a half, yeah, five and a half overall on other accounts yeah. and shit what, what's your pubg hours up to now 15 15k Whew, that's insane yeah 15k in five years i've played a lot yeah <laughs> i mean to be fair i wonder what that works out have you calculated like what I, that would be I per don't day i want to know <laughs> i feel like since uh like the beginning of high school a third yeah. of my time awake is probably 50 percent of my time awake has probably been spent playing computer games and when i think about it like that i'm like what am i doing with my life making money making a career playing professionally being competitive you're doing something with you your know, life I mean, you can tell yourself sure imagine trying to tell like a caveman like a thousand years ago <laughs> not a caveman a thousand years ago like a roman or something like i just sit at this desk all day and just <laughs> and i've done that for half my life they'd be like what is wrong with you bro? you mean you don't go out and hunt and get your food yeah like like they're hunting they got spears grapes he's probably like fit you know what i mean like <laughs> Uh, do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you know. I'm big into like nature. Like I always like wake up with the sunlight, sleep with the window open, all that kind of stuff. But 
I feel like we're just a couple of blunts away from the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Do you watch many podcasts? I don't watch that many podcasts, no. I just scroll Instagram and every time I just see Joe Rogan like <laughs> the monkey grippers or something and like attaching dumbbells to your feet or like this yeah. mushroom like supplement. Like I just see ads like that all the time and I'm just like, you must be talking about some crazy shit there. I think, I think that's the goal eventually is to uh, not emulate Joe Rogan. But well, I, mean, I like his guests, like the fact that he can just get anything from like a politician yeah, to a scientist yeah. to like a, an actor. I think oh, who knows? We might be decriminalizing weed eventually in Victoria. Hopefully, so hopefully. we could add the blunt element to it as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, I think the goal would be to try and get Scomo on here as well eventually one day. Scomo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we're we're reaching uh, DGen levels here. An hour and a half. I think that's pretty, pretty bloody good. Uh, we'll look to wrap things up. Um, James has been an absolute fucking pleasure. Obviously, love you. Known you a long, long time now. Very proud of the career that you've uh, that you've built. I just want to say thank you for coming on, joining us. Uh, I, like as soon as I knew you were back home, I was like, got to get him on before he leaves again <laughs> yeah, but he was like that for sure yeah when, when do you leave uh probably a little bit after new year's just spending christmas with the family yeah and then straight back to the grind i mean the grind is still on right yeah the grind is on oh actually so like the grind has been leveled up so like at the start of this year the malaysia tournament i was like kind of grinding i had a girlfriend and like we broke up and like i've missed like maybe two weeks of gym since april to now and playing every single day it's just like the grind's been leveled up so, so if you want to be successful in esports do not have a missus i mean <laughs> i'm not gonna say that <laughs> verbatim but <laughs> know, that's what it sounds like to me <laughs> yeah, flood's got a missus i think he's done better than ever yeah i mean yeah some some people it works well apparently yeah but yeah. Uh, very very lastly what, what, what do you think of good old flood he's doing well on luminosity he's probably the most comparable luke's he's dropped off although i do oh. know where he's he's gone back to the old uh na next year it's not announced yet. not announced yet well, i just said he's going back to night all right <laughs> no leaks sorry fucking leaks sorry, buddy. Oh, well. <laughs> if any PUBG fans made it this deep in the podcast then this, hey that's a easter special egg. easter egg yeah yeah um what, what do you think of, especially those two like i guess they've been not comparable but they've kind of been side by side with you obviously there's been cow and a couple of others like nikus and maybe hiker done some gas cans things but i think luke and and flood they've been there longer with you do you kind of chat with them do you talk with them like what, what, what's the relationship yeah obviously i love them as people like flood and i have been good friends since we were 16 we went to like some duos tournament in the city together and then atletico mangy showed up we won like 300 bucks he took us out for dumplings like we got a lot of history there so i love them i'm gonna get mangy on the potty you gotta get mangy on the podcast yeah. the main difference between like me and them is i just streamed mm. I, I think that i focused a lot on growing my brand um and they didn't and i for all pro players out there, like I think that they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot if they don't. Like that's the only reason that I am where I am now and they are where they are is literally just because I spent more time. Mm, grinding. Like, grinding, streaming, playing the game. Well, I, I remember when Luke joined TSM, like when they got picked up by TSM, everyone was like, stream, fucking stream. Every fucking day, stream. I don't care if you got 10, 10 viewers, just like build and grind. And you just, it's just not a streamer. To be fair, like not everyone can do it. Yeah. I mean, for my first 1,000 hours streamed, I made less than a dollar an hour. And like, when I look, when I look back at that and I realized that, I was kind of like, damn, like, what was I doing? But like, at the same time, it's a necessary part of the grind. You have to, mm. it's going to be like that. Streaming is an exponential thing. It takes that to then get to 100 viewers to then get to 1,000 viewers. Yeah. I didn't get an international event for the first three years of my career as a caster. And then it kind of snowballs from there. So it's the same thing, I guess, in that early day grind. You're like, you're not really making much money. I was fortunate because I was at uni. So I was able to like kind of juggle both. Like I wasn't making much, but like it was just enough as like a uni side job. Yeah, exactly. And then you finish uni and then, then snowballed from there. But yeah, we'll look to wrap it up. We, we rambled on a little bit. Love a good waffle. And we'll go have some dinner now and, um, and catch up properly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, mate. Really, really appreciate it. Obviously taking time out of a very busy grinding schedule anything you want to say as we uh wrap things up yeah thank you so much guys for watching hopefully you enjoy the show make sure you uh like subscribe and hit the bell of course they didn't tell me to do that but <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> you support well the boys we love it well trained yeah, see you guys next mate we can fucking just we don't even need to say anything now we gotta do the patreon segue though yeah that, that's a pro right there um but with that we will look to to wrap things up for episode number two jake and guys and uh I think on the next episode, I might get you to talk a little bit more. This one was a bit more of a... Well, if, we haven't, if we've got a guest from Siege, perhaps. 
but I enjoyed just sitting here and, and listening for yeah. sure. Yeah, certainly a lot of fun. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it, especially you made it this far in definitely our longest episode on any of the uh, ones that we've done. Tiggleton said it best. Hit the subscribe button, hit that bell notification. Let us know how you uh, thought things went in the comments down below. And uh, obviously we get our Patreon exclusive. We'll be chatting just a tiny bit longer with, uh, with James over there. If you want to join in and uh, see what we get up to in the Patreons, the uh, link is typically above. It's usually where you put it. Yeah, somewhere. Somewhere above. So uh, thank you so much for watching. We love you all. And hopefully we'll see you in the next episode.